And our final paper for this session is entitled Fiberless Optoelectrodes Scaling, Mapping, and Closed Loop Control by our chairman today, uh, Dr. Yushik Yoon. Yushik. All right. Thank you, Ken. Uh, my talk will be short. Um, this is the last talk. And uh, I assign a, a little bit short uh, amount of time for my talk. Um, uh, let me talk about uh, some the fi fiberless uh, optoelectro development here in Michigan, and maybe uh, uh, review some of the work that we did, and also uh, update uh, what we have made a progress over the years in the future direction. Um, and this is the optogenetic probe, and, and, and a lot of people still using in the field for in vivo measurement um, and behavioral uh, response. Still, they are putting an optical fiber onto the uh, animal's brain um, and uh, monitor, you know, uh, exciting the target neurons uh, through the light. And, um, and, then, and, and then there's no, uh, not, not really uh, electrical uh, measurement, but also having uh, behavioral feedback. So, question that I try to uh, answer is how do we uh, make uh, the miniaturized optoelectrode to deliver the light uh, to understand the local circuit activity. There are activity, uh, there are some of the previous work done here. Most people putting a optical fiber and uh, uh, putting a tetrode wires coming into together intertwined um, and it's pretty much like hand assembly. Um, so it's a special resolution is, uh, is software. Um, and also they can put a multiple fiber, uh, but mostly uh, they are doing a single uh, light uh, introduction. And uh, you know, Yuri's group uh, putting uh, this assembling, this is amazing work, a hand assembly of the thin optical fiber glued on uh, silicon uh, probe shank. And uh, you can see uh, the light is coming out from distal end of the optical fiber. Um, and, but still, you can see the, the distal end of the fiber is not really well aligned. When I take a look at it, uh, as an engineer, I think we can do it better um, and having monolithically integrating optical waveguide onto the probe shank. That's what we actually did it. Starting with the uh, uh, SU-8 polymer, um, and we think it's uh, easier to integrate it. Uh, and uh, having this uh, fiber integrated on, onto the silicon fiber and the light coming from the optical fiber still. This, this is not a fiber list yet, uh, but for the scaling, we need to get rid of this fiber and making a optical uh, source at the back end of the probe, which, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And the light is guided into, uh, through the optical fiber and they're coming out from the dis dis distal end. And we can photographically uh, define uh, the waveguide precisely to the recording array. Um, we had a really hard time to make this SU-8 working polymer. I'm glad to see that Ilchu at KISS to make it working and getting the in vivo data. And then we switched into the uh, dialectic waveguide, um, having into a rather than uh, thick uh, SU-8 optical uh, uh, waveguide integrated but having this oxynitride dielectric deposition to reduce the, the height of the uh, waveguide uh, below five micron, and also achieve a pretty high a coupling uh, efficiency and deliver the light, uh, because this uh, dielectric waveguide has a transmission efficiency is much, much better than um, uh, the polymer waveguide. And, um, and then we can talk about, and, and then is there a way to switch the wavelengths uh, very simply, uh, providing a different uh, light source in the, from the back. And uh, this is the integration of the optical mixer, um, and uh, done by one of uh, my previous uh, posta. Uh, he was here in the audience uh, um, in the morning. Um, and when you switch the light from the back, either you can, uh, uh, in guiding a blue uh, for uh, channel rhodopsin uh, stimulation and, and switch it into the maybe yellow for halo rhodopsin. You, either you can excite the neuron or inhibit the neuron activity by simply switching the light. We realized this, but it took a long time because of this. Uh, you know, now we are becoming too fiberless, so there is no optical fiber from the in the from the back, and that we are integrating actually here laser diode uh, in the back and uh, laser diode, uh, diode light is guided through the green lens. I will show you in the next slide how we do it. 
and then the, the light is coming into the optical mixer and coming out from the distal end. So this one we can uh, simply uh, switching the light source in the back, the LED by electrical switching, completely fiberless. You can switch the wavelength from uh, blue to red and also we can uh, illuminate blue red together simultaneously. This laser dye is coming from the uh, blue ray, um, therefore the wavelength is four or five, uh, a little bit off from the optimal wavelength for channel rhodopsin, but it worked out pretty well because we making uh, the separation between uh, the red from uh, the blue uh, to inhibit uh, possible interference between these two options. The way we can do this work uh, very reliably uh, is uh, by introducing self-aligned assembly technology. Here we are having the, the wave guide integrated with the, uh, the silicon technology and the micro machine, the silicon structure, the jig uh, is made separately. And then we assemble on top of the PCB and then we have put pl placing a green lens uh, onto this and then making the self assembly process. Uh, this green lens give us a really large uh, freedom of uh, tolerating misalignment. Um, so green, what green lens does is it has a gradient, um, the index of refraction, so higher at the center and the lower in the middle. So when the light is coming in and not depending on the angle and the misalignment here, so light is coming out from the other end at the center, if we can put the right wavelengths of the, uh, the green lens. So as you can see here, this coupling efficiency can be achieved like over 90% with the alignment of the tolerance around plus minus 20 microns. So with this, we could assemble multi-shank structure. As shown here, we can assemble uh, eight LDs, four uh, blue LDs and uh, four red LDs here. And then these are the green lens. Uh, the LDs are very small, shown here, flipped to bonded. And then these are the probe and optical mixers are shown here and the light is coming out from the distal end here. So by uh, switching the LED in the back by using electrical signal, uh, we can uh, deliver the light to the end of the optical fiber, the blue, or we can switch it into the red and the light is coming out. And also we can uh, simultaneously deliver uh, two light together to the same spot. So what we can do from here is we just validate in vivo in, in Yuri's lab uh, and uh, uh, then English uh, did this. So first of all, we did uh, the excitation of the uh, neural activity by channel rhodopsin here, the, the blue, and also inhibition. We are using arch rhodopsin because the wavelength is favorable for the arch, not the halo rhodopsin. And we can inhibit the neural activity. And the, the other thing which is a really, uh, um, uh, exciting to Yuri, uh, and, but we are providing technology, is the feedback and connection uh, from the pyramidal neuron and the interneuron. In this case, uh, it's not an inhibition, both of them the uh, excitation. One's for the um, channel rhodopsin, the other one is the uh, arch rhodopsin. And as you can see here, as uh, you can increase the intensity of the blue, and, and, and I'm sorry, the blue is here, and also you can have the red. So if you increase the intensity of the red, what it does is that it's stimulating this interneuron, and then this will be getting a negative feedback to suppress the firing of the uh, pyramidal <coughs> neuron. So this one uh, provides uh, the capability to understand the circuit connectivity in the small and densely populated region uh, in, in the Cape campus. The one that we uh, uh, did follow is, can we integrate light source directly onto the probe shank? Uh, that's the one we have done. Um, and we published, and then we having a, a blue LED, a small size, a 10 by 15, a neural size, and high, uh, densely uh, integrated onto the probe shank uh, in a Basaki 32 configuration. So this can be done by using a gallium nitride on silicon wafer. Uh, this wafer is exactly being used for LED lighting business. Thanks to the LED lighting business, we could acquire this wafer now in, onto the six inch wafer. Uh, we haven't processed, but the other process has been done recently on four inch wafer. Uh, we uh, define the uh, LED um, in a small size. The, the quantum well is being etched, making a mass structure and, and integrating with the uh, recording site. As you can see here, in this uh, prototype, we integrate three uh, LEDs in the, with the uh, eight recording site. 
and then we etch them uh, by using uh, silicon magical machining technology, technology, and this is the release the probe shank, the, uh, the four shank device, and then you can see this LED, uh, pretty well defined, uh, with, uh, with a pretty high yield. And then we can see here the probe uh, onto the US penny. The, we can eliminate one uh, LED, uh, and we can also eliminate all of them. We can switch them, um, and uh, we have a very high special uh, temporal resolution. Uh, with this, we could actually, um, I'm not going to get into the detail, but uh, this is done by and also Yuri's lab. Uh, at the time, it's uh, Iran Stark. And uh, we eliminate, uh, we can excite a neuron uh, with a very extremely low power, 80 uh, nanowatt power, um, probably single or maybe two to three neurons in the vicinity of the, uh, the, the, the LED site. They one in direct elimination, elimination and, and, and uh, neurons are fired with the no phase delay, and some neurons are firing with the phase delay, delay and this is the uh, in, indirectly uh, connected with the uh, neurons uh, in the vicinity of this uh, LED site. So we can having uh, this uh, uh, neuronal activity and, and having uh, the high special resolution and illuminating LED in any place um, in any sequential way and, and simultaneously recording a neuronal activity. And it was our surprise, actually, our question is how long can we do that? Uh, still, uh, we cannot answer uh, the question with the very statistical robust data yet. Still, uh, we need to collect more data. And this is one of the example, uh, the one of the probe we just explained after 92 days from the URIS lab. And we just uh, still can illuminate uh, some of them. And uh, um, um, uh, the gallium nitride, uh, uh, the mass structure LED uh, coated with the uh, uh, some protection layer works pretty well over the long longevity uh, of the time. Still, we had a problem, and for the last one or two years, we've been put on our effort to actually um, uh, reduce the stimulation artifact. Uh, the data that I showed you is done by having a sinusoidal uh, stimulation, um, because stimulation artifact is so severe, uh, so we put a fiber sinusoidal wave uh, to uh, to eliminate the LED, that works pretty well because there is the exponential relationship between IV characteristic of the LEDs. But if you are applying a purse signal, this is what you can see, and we can have a significant um, stimulation artifact observed over here. So we try to reduce this. It is mainly coming from the coupling because this is a densely populated electrical wire coming into this, and also LED and the recording side on the same substrate. So what we try to do is making a multiple layer. Uh, this is showing the uh, two layer metal, completely shielding uh, the recording side uh, from the, uh, the LED illumination, uh, electrical connection and device then we can significantly reduce the stimulation artifact. The current version um, that my student Khan has developing is three-layer metal structure and shielding more of the, uh, the stimulation artifact by uh, the, the, the giving a solution from the, the device hardware. And the, the other solution that we're providing is can we really eliminate you know, the last mile, the, the, this stimulation artifact at the onset and, and when we turn on and off the, uh, the LEDs. And um, this work has done by Adam Mandrella. And, uh, and this one, um, this is the signal we uh, apply the purse, and this is the, the purse shaping. So we are uh, introducing a smooth transition of the purse when it turn on and turn off, and then we can significantly reduce the stimulation artifact. So by introducing multi-stacking layer uh, on this silicon fabric and a pro fabrication, as well as a pearl shaping, you could remove almost the uh, stimulation artifact. The next is uh, scaling, um, and can we make it more than uh, 12 LEDs? Yes, we can, and this is one of the example, and uh, this is the direction that we are taking, and, and, and we are looking forward to having your feedback, and these are the uh, checkerboard style of the uh, the LED and recording side uh, arrangement. Uh, the blue is the micro LEDs and, and the yellow is the recording side. And also this is another configuration. 
uh, we, um, Prop of Council, we made a 40-channel uh, uh, um, uh, stimulation array to 40 LEDs, which can be illuminated over um, uh, the sequential way or any arbitrary combination. Um, but that is uh, not an easy job. It, it is it's not trivial. Um, and uh, controlling 40 LEDs, more than 40, even 12 LEDs, uh, in a, any arbitrary sequential way is not trivial. So we designed a custom chip in here, which can handle and, and driving 40 uh, LEDs all together. Uh, we are trying to integrate this to controlling the LEDs. And uh, recently, uh, we integrated uh, the uh, making a single combo chip and 32 channel recording and a 12 LED driver having onto a integrated and, and then packaged in a very small form factor in a, in a half stage. So we have shown over here uh, the one that I showed you, 32 channel recording and 12 uh, stimulation uh, probe will be connected with this combo chip. Only a few digital wires coming out from there. And this is a recording. And uh, this, uh, this is the, uh, uh, and having a driving circuit to driving the, uh, the LEDs. And uh, still this one requires some of the uh, recording signal coming into the PC and do uh, data analysis and then making a decision and putting back into the stimulation side for the stimulation. And, uh, uh, but this one is, uh, we, we integrate this one for scaling uh, to the next stage. And currently we are uh, planning to uh, making 256 recording channels and 128 LEDs. Then it, it is essential uh, to having this a combo chip uh, to minimize the interconnection. And at the end, when we do the scaling, problem is interconnection. Um, but still, uh, uh, we need your feedback, and then we have a big discussion, maybe over dinner and lunchtime, and how do we providing uh, close of feedback? And uh, I need your neuroscience feedback. What is the best way to having this? And that will be translated into the hardware implementation. With that, uh, recently uh, uh, we are lucky to have a NSF Neuronex uh, program launched. Um, and uh, this will allow us to having a dissemination of this technology to the community. Uh, and the team with the multiple uh, the faculty here at U of M and also uh, Viviana Greiner at Caltech, uh, we are having this uh, clarity and uh, AAV technology combined with the Darwin's a rainbow technology. Uh, and this will be giving us the ability having a structural connectivity mapping in conjunction with this optoelectrode EFIS uh, functional connectivity. And we are providing more uh, modality, uh, chemical sensing on the structural cellular recording uh, from Cindy, Chaste, and also advanced uh, nanofractal uh, structure uh, from Jim Valent. And uh, we are uh, providing this technology to the community uh, currently. So uh, if you wanted to try some of our uh, probes, uh, please uh, come and talk to us. And if you need uh, this volume uh, access of this technology, they will be available from uh, the company uh, Neuralight Technology. So I'd like to thank you and, uh, you know, collaborator and still can, active and, you know, giving us advice and involvement. And uh, here, uh, the John Simo, um, he is leading uh, the optoelectrode research activity. If you want and try some of these optoelectric uh, technology, John is uh, the guy you need to talk to. He's uh, just uh, standing in the back, so you can, you can talk to him, then you may get uh, these devices. Um, and uh, also, Yuri um, uh, is a longtime collaborator. Uh, he makes our uh, probe working in the actual in vivo uh, testing. And all the in vivo work from this probe has been done in Yuri's lab. I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of my students and Khan and did some, this multi-layer stacking of the uh, probe fabrication, and Adam did this uh, wave shaping uh, to reduce the stimulation artifact, and Komal did the uh, waveguide probe fabrication. With that, I'd like to thank you, and uh, maybe I can take some questions if you have. <laughs>